born to battle, their birth announcement a brief 140-word congressional resolution. Resolved that two battalions of Marines be raised, that they be distinguished by the names of the 1st and 2nd Battalions of American Marines, and that they be considered a part of the number which the Continental Army before Boston is ordered to consist of. Today, more than two centuries later, their proud heritage still guides the Corps. So come with us now down the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, to Bella Wood and Guadalcanal, to Chosin and Chulai, and relive the glory that is the United States Marines. The fledgling nation was at war. Its ragtag army and navy hard pressed on land and sea. Another force was needed. Despite the revolt against England, the mother country was still the model for most institutions, and the members of the Maritime Commission used the Royal Marines as their model. On March 3rd, 1776, the newly formed Continental Marines stormed the island of New Providence in the Bahamas. The prize? Desperately needed military supplies. The United States Marines' first action was a roaring success. 71 cannon, hundreds of pounds of shot and powder seized without a single casualty. Marines were assigned to every ship of the newly created Navy, where they scrambled up the masts and picked off enemy seamen with withering musket fire. Unfortunately, they made excellent targets themselves. During John Paul Jones' great victory over the British frigate Serapis, 67 Marines were killed or wounded. With Independence won, the new United States Congress set a precedent it has often followed, dismantling the nation's defenses. Except for a small guard force of 100 men, the Army, Navy, and Marines were disbanded. Shipping was the lifeblood of the new nation, and it was threatened by the Barbary Coast pirates. After paying $2 million in ransom and tribute, Congress declared millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, and authorized funds for six frigates and a Marine Corps of 881 officers and men. One of the new ships, the USS Constitution, bombarded the pirate stronghold of Tripoli. Then, under cover of darkness, Naval Lieutenant Stephen Decatur led a party of Marines on a daring raid on the pirate ships in the harbor. Then, in one of the wildest escapades in Marine history, Lieutenant Presley O'Banion marched a squad of seven Marines, 40 Greek mercenaries, and an Arab pretender to the throne of Tripoli from Egypt to Dern, Tripoli. Here, the American consul attempted to install the Pasha as the new ruler of Tripoli. O'Banion and his motley crew stormed the city, and the defending Arab garrison of 800 men fled. The charge on the shores of Tripoli is immortalized in the Marine hymn, and it also marked the first time the Marines raised the American flag over a foreign-held fort. That tradition has long been maintained. Other traditions, too, have long been part of the Corps.
to distinguish themselves in the war of 1812. In expeditions against pirates in the West Indies and on the other side of the world in Borneo. In China, the Marines went ashore in Canton to protect the lives and property of American traders. It still wasn't a very large corps, only 63 officers and 1,200 men. But in 1836, a new war was looming. Americans pushed westward had settled in Texas, which was bound to Mexico by the weakest of ties. A confrontation was inevitable, and it came at the Alamo, where 200 Texans were finally overwhelmed by a Mexican army of 3,000. Texas declared itself a republic and fought the Mexicans for 10 years until finally the United States annexed Texas and went to war with Mexico. And again it was the Marines who led the charge. Marines were landed at Yerba Buena, California and raised the American flag. Today the little town is known as San Francisco. Marines also captured the towns of Santa Barbara, Los Angeles and San Diego and suddenly the United States had reached the Pacific Coast. But it was at Veracruz in Mexico where the Marines stormed the fortress atop Chapultepec, captured it in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting and added the halls of Montezuma to their hymn. The Civil War tore apart not only the nation, but the Marine Corps as well. Nearly half the captains and two-thirds of the first lieutenants resigned and offered their services to the Confederate States Marine Corps. It was a terrible war for both sides, and the Marines, for the most part, were shunted aside by the citizen soldiers who fought the war. After the Civil War, the Marines were back at the old stand of protecting American interests in the far corners of the world. And then suddenly, there was a real war to fight. Cuba was in revolt against her Spanish colonial masters. The USS Maine had been mysteriously blown up in Havana Harbor, and we were at war again. Now what kind of shoot the Rough Rider buttons up the side, they call five and a half. In the first action of the war, the Marines charged ashore at Guantanamo Bay and routed its 800 Spanish defenders. When they get back from Spain, they're going to honor my all about that battleship Once more, the Marines had landed and raised the flag on enemy ground. Now America was a world power. Spain had ceded Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, and Wake Island as part of the peace agreement. The war had also led to a new naval doctrine. Coal to fuel the mighty steam-driven battleships was the key to victory at sea. Wars would now be won by the nation that had advanced bases for coaling the new steamships. The acquisition of those bases became the heart of American naval strategy. Its implementation was to be the job of the Marine Corps to seize and defend those bases. Other nations were raising huge armies to implement their own visions of imperial glory. War was inevitable. the British fleet blockaded Germany. The German response? The submarine. At first, American sympathies lay with Germany. 
but unrestricted U-boat warfare brought the United States into the war on the side of the Allies. And on June 14, 1917, the first of the Corps, the 5th Regiment of Marines, sailed for France. Once again, the Marines had landed on a foreign shore. After a few weeks of training, they were moving up to the front, to the miles of muddy trenches that had formed the battle lines for three years. Suddenly, they were engulfed by a wave of retreating French troops. The Germans had mounted a mighty offensive designed to win the war at last. The French implored the Marines to retreat with them. Retreat hell, snarled a Marine captain. We just got here. Here was Bellow Wood, a square mile of rocks, woods, and the 461st Imperial German Infantry. The Marines attacked through woods and rocky fields, some across a green wheat field rippling under the impact of machine gun bullets. Behind them, the French government was packing, preparing to flee Paris. The Marines charged again and again. Nothing, neither machine guns, nor gas, nor bombs could stop them. They drove the Germans from Bellow Wood and then withstood several German counterattacks. In Paris, the government unpacked. The German drive had been stopped. In World War I, the Marines added the airplane to their arsenal. In DH-4s, dubbed Flying Coffins, the Marines flew anti-submarine patrols, photo reconnaissance missions, dueled enemy fighters, and once even provisioned a trapped French infantry regiment. With World War I, the Marines were in the air to stay. Their main task, close-in air support of Marines on the ground. had determined to end the war with a last great push. On March 21st, 1918, the front exploded. Then the Allies counterattacked, spearheaded by half a million Americans. The increasing weight of American military might prove too much for the Germans. At last, on November 11th, 1918, after four years of bloody butchery, the war ended. And as in every other war, the Marines had covered themselves with glory. 32,000 officers and men of the Corps served in France and were awarded 12 medals of honor, 744 Navy crosses, and 1,720 American and other foreign decorations. peacetime way of life. The Marine Corps was just as swiftly reduced in size and we found new heroes. In sports, and in the streets. The Roaring Twenties became one huge party. of depression.
nation second the economy of the entire world. Germany embraced as its savior a ranting megalomaniac who rearmed his nation and plunged Europe back into war. the Japanese Empire was also arming and reaching out for the resources it so desperately wanted to feed its growing industrial might. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. A state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. America's Pacific battle fleet had been destroyed. The Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, all had fallen to the invading Japanese. But even as the Japanese advanced, America was turning soft civilians into Marines with leather-lunged, stone-hearted sergeants known as DIs, drill instructors. <laughs> were stopped for the first time at Midway. Now the Americans went on the offensive. The target, Guadalcanal, a big island in the Solomon chain. Ribbed by mountains, fleshed in jungle, swamp, and sword grass. With an old story by Jack London and an ancient snapshot postcard sent by a missionary years before as their only guide, the Marines stormed Guadalcanal. and quickly captured an almost completed Japanese airfield. It was renamed Henderson Field. Then the Japanese struck back. Landing thousands of reinforcements and supplies under cover of darkness, they counterattacked. Waves of howling Japanese crashed out of the jungles in night attacks, night after night. Each time they were beaten back, often in hand-to-hand -hand battles that were the most savage of the war. And always there was the other enemy, the tropics. 
Men rattled with the fever of malaria, were racked by dysentery, blistered by the blazing sun, and drenched by torrential rains that turned the battleground into a stinking, festering slime. the Japanese evacuated the island. Guadalcanal had fallen to the Marines, and the tide of war had definitely turned. Still, the Japanese clung to the islands with grim fanaticism. None was more tightly held than Tarawa in the Gilbert Island chain. Not in a million years will the Americans take Tarawa, boasted the Japanese commander on the island. The Marines turned a million years into 76 hours, but at a fearful price. Forced to wade through half a mile of waist-high water, only one of five Marines in the first wave ever reached the beach. Still, they came ashore, seized and held the beach and painfully, under deadly Japanese fire, moved inland. Tarawa was the bloodiest island victory. 990 Marines dead, 2,391 wounded. The Japanese force of 5,000 had died almost to a man. There were only 17 survivors. Now the Marines began to feel like kangaroos, hopping from island to island in the inexorable drive toward Japan. that would storm the Japanese home islands. Iwo Jima, a small volcanic rock of an island, contained several Japanese airfields. From them, enemy fighters had been attacking B-29s on their way back from bombing raids on Japan. The capture of Iwo would not only eliminate this threat, it would provide an ideal emergency landing field for crippled bombers returning home and a base for American fighters to escort the bombers over Japan. Iwo was a prize well worth taking, and intelligence said it would be a piece of cake. The cake proved to be hard as rock. 21,000 fanatical Japanese were dug into caves of volcanic rock that bombs could not even dent. Glowering down on the Marines was Mount Suribachi, where Japanese artillery raked the beaches. And from atop Mount Suribachi, the Japanese could see every move the Marines made and counter it immediately. It was a fearful struggle. American casualties were 19,000 wounded and 7,000 killed. On Iwo, said Admiral Chester Nimitz, Uncommon valor was a common virtue.
Japanese defenders, only 200 were left alive. And once again, the Marines raised the flag. the sea lanes were wide open for the invasion of Japan, an operation that would cost an estimated one million American casualties. But Japan was not invaded. In a ball of fire and a mushrooming cloud, a city was destroyed and 78,000 people killed. The atomic bomb had ended World War II. We are gathered here representatives of the major warring powers to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers will now sign on behalf of all the nations at war with Japan. with an overwhelming joy. The wartime economy swiftly shifted into peacetime pursuits. While the Marines waited for the next war. In the interim, they polished up one of their most treasured traditions, turning the salute into an art form. Communist North Korean troops invaded South Korea. American troops were rushed from Japan, but they could only slow the communist invaders. Seoul, the capital of South Korea, fell to the communists. The UN forces were pushed back into a narrow pocket on the southeastern tip of the Korean peninsula. This was the Pusan perimeter. There was nowhere further to retreat. Behind the Americans, there was only the sea. Stateside, more Marines were being hurriedly loaded on transports for the long trip to Korea. on the beleaguered UN forces, General Douglas MacArthur took the U.S. 1st Marine Division and the Army's 7th Infantry on a daring end run on the west coast of Korea. The Marines and infantry landed and swiftly captured the port city of Incheon. Ahead 
lay the Han River, a swirling muddy torrent a mile wide. Crossing it was a full-scale amphibious operation. Beyond the Han lay Seoul, the capital of South Korea. 10,000 enemy troops held every major building and street junction in the city. Their orders? Fight to the death. The Marines did their best to oblige the enemy. September 26th, Seoul was retaken and returned to the South Koreans. Now the Marines were pulled out, loaded on transports to make another amphibious assault, this time on the East Coast and this time in North Korean territory. sometimes seems as easy as a ride in the country. in the strangely different quilted uniforms of some of the prisoners. The Marines push forward to the Yalu River, the border of Red China. But the war that seems almost over is not. Thousands of Chinese stream over the border, engulfing the UN forces. Once again, they are forced to fight a holding action. In the bitter, frozen Korean mountains, the temperature drops to 20 and 30 below zero. The Marines are ordered to attack the Chinese, who are dug in around the Chosin Reservoir. This will enable the bulk of the UN forces to retreat to the port of Hungnam, where the Navy can take them off. It is a fearful trap. 20,000 American Marines must now run a gauntlet between 100,000 Chinese, whose sole aim is to annihilate the 1st Marine Division. We are not retreating, General Oliver Smith tells his men. We are merely attacking in another direction. It was a devastating attack. With planes like this F-4U Corsair, Marine and Navy pilots flew close in air support, slashing the Chinese columns to bloody ribbons. It had taken them two weeks to fight every inch of the 45 miles from the Chosin Reservoir, and the cost had been fearful. There were 7,500 Marine casualties. 730 had been killed, and about half of the rest were victims of frostbite. The Chinese losses were far greater, for the trap had literally exploded in their faces. They suffered 37,500 casualties, 25,000 killed in what historians now call the greatest fighting withdrawal in the history of modern warfare. Cho Sin had joined Guadalcanal, Bella Wood, and the other names that are covered with marine blood and glory. Now the bleeding, freezing troops created a wall of fire. Behind it, a gigantic amphibious landing in reverse was begun. From Hung Nam, the Navy took off 105,000 troops, 17,500 vehicles, 
and 350,000 tons of supplies. And an entirely unlooked for cargo, 90,000 North Koreans who simply did not want to live under communist rule any longer. After breaking out of the Chinese trap, the Marines were again thrown at the Communists, this time in a pair of operations known as Killer and Ripper. For six weeks, the 5th Marines hammered at the Chinese and once again drove the Reds across the border into North Korea. War had stabilized along the 38th parallel, the line that had divided Korea at the end of World War II. But now both sides were talking. And as the talks dragged on, men continued to fight and die, taking and holding a series of ridges whose bloody imprints are stamped on marine history. Bunker Hill, Bloody Ridge, T-Bone, and The Hook. also developed a new assault tactic, taking and holding a hill in no man's land by helicopter. The first wave cleared a landing area. Minutes later, the rest of the Marines had landed. With helicopters, the Marines were able to wrest the high ground from the enemy without first having to fight their way to it. talks dragged on. But finally, on July 27, 1953, a grudging peace fell over Korea. Once again, the Marines had done the job and were ready to share in the pleasures of a nation at peace. be allowed a respite. The Cold War would grow hot in a number of places as the Russians probed and tested the resolve of the free world to remain free. We responded, sending in the Marines in Lebanon, Cuba, and other hot spots in the late 50s and 60s to cool things down. Striving for an ideal which is close to the heart of every American and for which in the past many Americans have laid down their lives. To serve these ideals is to serve the cause of peace, security and well-being, not only for us, in the Mediterranean, but for all The government of Lebanon has requested, and I have approved, the deployment of United States forces to Beirut as part of a multinational force. Things didn't stay cool, or suddenly we were in another hot war in Asia, in Vietnam. It was in many ways the most difficult and agonizing war in the Marines' history. Certainly the most difficult to explain and understand. Many of the Marines' operations were well-remembered routines, amphibious landings, jungle patrols, digging in. For this new kind of war, the Marines
developed new tactics. Helicopters gave the war a vertical dimension. No sooner were the Viet Cong spotted than the Marines were lifted in to bring the war to the largely unseen enemy. Suddenly, the character of the war changed. In February 1968, the North Vietnamese Army swept across the border to support the Viet Cong guerrillas. It was the eve of Tet, the Vietnamese New Year. They captured Hue, the ancient imperial capital of Vietnam. The fighting to retake the city became one of the fiercest battles of the war. 12,000 North Vietnamese soldiers held way and it fell to the United States Marines to drive them out. Vietnamese fought fanatically, but in the bitter street fighting, the Marines finally drove the enemy from way. But more often, it was a new kind of war against a mostly unseen enemy. sun and torrential rain. These the Marines had seen before. And other ways to fight an enemy whose goal was not only the conquest of land, but of people's minds. was perhaps the most confusing war the American Marine has ever fought. Fighting with one hand and rebuilding a shattered land with the other. It was an impossible demand, and yet all part of the job for United States Marines. 